Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to have all of you here in person. And we say hello to all of you online. We appreciate you joining us this morning. You belong here and you're part of this worship service. So we'd like to welcome you to First Presbyterian Church at Dallas Center in Iowa. And um, while you're listening and watching, if you'll type in the comment section where you're watching from and um, any kind of prayers you have or joys you'd like to share, we'd like to include those at that time in our service. Um, we have some announcements today. We are in the works and discussion about our uh, grand opening for our fellowship hall. Um, those plans are being made. We also have our big WOW back to school bash coming up and the date is TBA. We're almost to a date on that and we're really excited about getting our fall kickoff going. And um, also confirmation will start in September and so I'll have letters out for the parents of those involved with that. So it's, uh, I'm really excited to get our Christian education up and rolling this fall. And are there any announcements from the congregation?
Praise be to you, God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for your great mercy in giving us birth into a new life and a new hope by raising Jesus Christ from death. Praise be to you, our God and Father, for an inheritance that can never spoil or fade, kept for us in heaven, lived out here on earth. Praise be to you, our God and Father, for the protection of your power, ours through faith, until salvation comes at the end of time. Praise be to you, our God and Father. Father, to you be all praise, glory, and honor through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Now our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation, hymn number 361.
hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power over us. And Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. All the old life has passed away, and a new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. May the peace of Christ be with you, and God also with you. Please feel free to get up and enjoy each other during our passing of the peace. I was told that I better not move it from its place. <laughs> You're welcome to wave or say hello, whatever you feel comfortable with. Good morning, Dennis. How are you doing? I think the smoke is coming.
for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. talking about what is your inheritance. And uh, in looking at the Old Testament here, it occurs, the whole theme of inheritance occurs over 500 times just in the 39 books of the Old Testament. And we're asking the same question that the Israelites asked. They were asking Joshua, what is our inheritance? We heard in that first scripture that Moses had given them this inheritance. And even though Moses didn't get to go into the promised land, if you'll remember, he died before they went in. Joshua let them in. And now they're beginning to receive the inheritance that they were given through the covenant that Moses gave them. From God to Moses. And I don't know if you've ever read a book called The Testaments by John Grisham. If you haven't, what I tell you is not a spoiler or anything. Um, it's about an eccentric billionaire who tragically dies, and all of his kids start to just go into war over who gets what inheritance, what part of the inheritance. And his entire inheritance, the $11 billion that he leaves behind, he leaves it behind to an illegitimate daughter who lives in the jungles of Brazil. So you can imagine how that goes over with the family and all the kids. But the crux of the story comes to this inheritance was given. It was already written into the will. It was already done. But will this daughter receive the inheritance that was given? You might think, well, of course she would. But there are many responsibilities that come with such a great gift. And just like it was true for the Israelites, they received their inheritance of land. But what they do with it is continue to be unfaithful to God throughout the entire story of the Israelites in the Old Testament. And it's also true of us that we each have an inheritance that's been given to us, already paid for in the past, on the cross, by Jesus. That inheritance has been given to us by God, but many of us do not walk in it. We do not know how to receive it. Uh, we continue walking in the old identity and not stepping into our new identity in Jesus Christ. So the context here in Joshua 13, all the way up until now, there was that first half of Joshua. And this signifies a turning point in Joshua 13 where we turn and go into the second half where Joshua is going about handing out the inheritance. So the whole first half of the book was about them fighting and conquering and going into the promised land and taking what God had promised them. But now it is they're receiving their portions of the land, and that's kind of what's going to go on here and in the future. But even though they received this inheritance, like I said before, the sad fact is that they continue their character, the characteristic of who the Israelites were over and over and over again was unfaithful. And that will define who the Israelites are from this point on. And the results or the consequences of that unfaithfulness in the Old Testament, it's regarding land. Everything is about land, right, in the Old Testament. And their inheritance of land, the opposite of that is exile, um, landlessness. They, they're desolate. They have no land to call their own. They have no home. And so that is the, what they're going to be faced with repeatedly for the unfaithfulness. And this loss of God's gift or inheritance, it continues through centuries until the moment that a word came to a young woman that she would give birth to God in the flesh and call him Jesus. That moment would change everything. The script completely changes. Jesus' own faithfulness in our world is what makes us faithful. Because human nature we never did change really from the Old Testament. We, um, that we're just like the Israelites in our own nature. But because Jesus came, it's his faithfulness that writes on our story and stamps us faithful. And this is really the good news of the gospel. We become that new identity as we receive. No matter what we ever do, 
God's faithfulness is ours. It defines who we are in this new identity. So our second reading there from 1 Peter that Aaron read, um, it reminds us that steeped in his own ancestor's story of being given an inheritance by God, Peter uses the inheritance as the dominant metaphor for something new, not land or wealth or health. He is referring to something that's eternal because of Jesus, our inheritance from God, is three things. It's been given, he is being tested, and is guaranteed forever. And those are the three movements I want to look at today in our scriptures. The first one about our inheritance from God, it has been given. So the grammar there tells us it's in the past. It was already completed. Jesus did that on the cross. You know, if you ask a Christian, when were you saved? Um, they, you may hear them tell you about a story of, wow, I realized that Jesus was real at this moment and my life began to change. Or I lived this way once and then had this encounter and then I became new and lived a different life. Or I was just living my life and then all of a sudden I realized God was with me. <clears throat> and that is very common, but theologically, Actually, what happened was on the cross, Jesus completed everything, all of our inheritance, salvation, deliverance, healing, all the things that um, the year of Jubilee that we've talked about in Isaiah 61, where the eyes may see, the ears hear, the prisoners are set free, all those things were completed at the time Jesus died on the cross. And it is in the resurrection of Christ the full payment of our inheritance was made. So it's not anything that we can do to earn it. It's nothing we can do. No good behavior will make it come to us, and no bad behavior will ever make it go away. I want to make sure you really hear that. There's nothing we can do. All of our service, all of our good deeds, everything we do is not for earning something from God, earning this inheritance, salvation, uh, life from God. <clears throat> Neither can our poor choices and bad behavior cause that spiritual reality to disappear. Now, there may be consequences for our poor choices in the nat in our world, but it does not take away our spiritual inheritance. So God is calling us to receive Christ's inheritance as co-heirs. You'll hear that many times in the New Testament, especially from Paul and Peter, where we're talked about we're co-heirs with Christ. So how will we respond to that, being a co-heir? Because it's not a salvation thing. That's already taken care of, right? We're not talking about salvation and going to heaven. That's something already dealt with. But this is about walking in our identity each and every day while we're here on earth. That freedom to respond to God's call is an essential ingredient to any loving relationship. It had to start with relationship to be given the inheritance. So I'd like to ask you today to talk, you know, really be aware, self-aware and reflective in your own life about how you are um, watering that um, relationship with God in your life on a daily basis. How are you engaging in that spiritual reality that is already yours, that Jesus paid so you could have a relationship, you could hear and be guided by the Holy Spirit. That is your inheritance. The second thing, it, it's already been given, past tense. It's already finished, as Christ told us on the cross. It is finished. But it is, it is currently being tested. And so our inheritance from God is being tested. And, you know, it's not a salvation thing, but it's a living into our inheritance and God-given identity thing. Um, many people, it's hard to grapple with the fact that we have this grace given to us by God. There's nothing we can do to earn it. But then we also have a responsibility to live into it by our actions and our commitments. And so that's our um, the expectation side. So you have grace, all God, and then you have the expectation, responsibility, that's us. And we're partners, we're co-heirs. Right? So both are important. It's a both and thing, not the either or. So some examples from scripture on testing uh, this inheritance. God said to Adam and Eve, you get any tree in the garden except one. 
And he left, God left the choice to them to choose. Uh, that was a test. God told Abraham to take his only son, Isaac, that was given to him miraculously, and to sacrifice him for God. Would he do it or not? That was a test. Job's whole life crumbled around him. If you know anything about the book of Job, it's just a horrific story. And even to the point of when his wife says, why don't you curse God and die? I mean, just, we got to make this stop. But would he curse God? That was a test. And then you might think, well, that's all the Old Testament, right? We don't have any of that in the New Testament because Jesus came and everything's great then. But Jesus himself modeled how we are tested. He went through the wilderness. Throughout his whole life, he was tested. And, of course, on the cross, he was tested. The disciples followed in that same path. Peter tried to walk on water. That was a test. And Peter refers to our testing even as... The inheritance, even though it has been given, quote, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, but those very trials strengthened your faith. And that is, of course, the purpose of any test, is to strengthen our faith. And one of my favorite movies that kind of came to mind uh, to illustrate some of this is, has anybody seen The Ultimate Gift? Gift. Oh my gosh, you can't say it. it's great. It's another billionaire story and how an inheritance is spent. So I guess I enjoy billionaire stories. But uh, <laughs> uh, the billionaire was a grandfather this time and he died. Um, there's this adult grandson. You know, there's lots of family members, but the story focuses on this adult grandson who is living a very unhealthy lifestyle, you know, with addictions, materialistic, indulgent, selfish, just a horrible lifestyle that he lives, you know. Um, but this wise grandfather, he had wanted the entire inheritance to go to this grandson. But he had conditions on the, inher on the uh, gift being given, and they come in the form of a series of gifts. And I can't remember, there might have been like 10 or 12 tests that had to, he had to go through. And so the grandson goes through, and the grandfather had left the video you know, in advance of his departing, leaving all the details of the test he had to pass. You know, one of the tests was the work test, and he sent him off to a cow farm in, you know, Texas or somewhere, and uh, he had to build fence posts by hand, by himself, you know, the big post and the steel wire. And, and you know, this, in, this kid didn't have a clue what it meant to work and uh, do manual labor and appreciate the hard work that you put in and what's left. So that was one of the tests he had to pass. And so the whole story goes along um, on all these tests he passed in order that he would receive the inheritance as someone who would respect it, appreciate it, and take good care of it and use it for the purpose of all inheritance is to bless other people, to bless someone else in some way. And at the end, that is a spoiler to the movie. He does um, do this, and he, this test there is to strengthen his character. And you can see the wisdom, even as God, as a father. I know we don't all relate to God as a father. It's a harmful image to some people. And so I recognize that as I use those words. But to me, it used to be a harmful image. And through many times of healing with God, God as a father has become a precious image to me. And so that story in that, in that uh, movie is very poignant to me because God in his ultimate wisdom is giving us this inheritance. But there is, you know, we talk about the pruning of fire and all these things that are metaphors for the difficult things, the things we have to go through in life that um, cause our faith to be strengthened so that this inheritance can flow through us in a way that it helps other people. And I'm not talking about money and wealth and health and all those things. That could be included, but mainly it's the presence of God working through us to other people. And so number three, our inheritance from God is guaranteed forever. And this uh, is a great comfort. Um, if you've ever struggled with thoughts in your mind that you're not good enough, that you're not measuring up, that um, you know, the, you just have too many marks on your record and that God is unable to um, 
be in relationship with you or love you or give you favor and peace and speak words of love over you, then this, I hope, will remove those lies from your mind that our inheritance from God is guaranteed forever. We talk about identity in Christ. The whole New Testament is full, especially in Paul's letters, of our shifting identity. And it's not that we become completely new people with new personalities and new desires and wants and everything is different, but God takes who we are and just begins developing the fruit of the Spirit within us. And we become a new creation, somebody that has not existed before. Um, I wrote down some of the words from many of you have heard this song by Lauren Nagel. Um, it's called You Say. And I'll just read the first part of this. And um, I think maybe many of you can relate to what she's talking about here. And it really is about her own journey of finding who she is in Christ. It says, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never, never measure up. And I'm more than just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. When I don't belong, you say that I am yours. And I believe. I believe what you say of me. And that is really the whole journey of the New Testament, is us <clears throat> realizing this inheritance that's already been given, and that we have a part to play in recognizing who we are in Christ, regardless of what we feel or what we've been told. What God tells us in Scripture about who we are is what actually matters. And there will be many tests that you get to walk through in life that you're challenged with. This is what the situation is telling me. Maybe my boss is telling me this, or maybe this friend or this person is saying this, but God tells me this. And so I'm going to choose to live into what God has spoken about me. And that may or may not change other people's perceptions of me, but that's not my issue. That's theirs. So that is part of the how our inheritance from God is guaranteed forever, is that our identity in Christ is secure. We just have to learn to walk in it. And then the year of Jubilee, which I talked about from the first day I've been here, that I really believe that this year of Jubilee is also symbolic of this journey of coming out of the wilderness and into our inheritance. It has already been given. Year of Jubilee, it's not just a one day or a one year event. It's about how we live into wholeness and healing and deliverance from ourselves and from outside forces where we're not so shaken anymore by the things that happen in and around us. And we begin to walk into this year of Jubilee that's been spoken over all of us. And lastly, the inheritance is Jesus Christ himself. You know, I think one of the reasons that the Israelites continued to fail God's tests is because they made land acquisition the end result. So it's like, okay, we went through the wilderness, and then we were saved from Egypt, and then we crossed over the Jordan, and we moved into the promised land, and ding, ding, this is what we did it all for. It was for land. And so their end result, result was off. It was not in the right spot. And I think some of us, it can be that same way. If salvation is our end result, if that's the only reason that we think faith matters, where we end up in eternity, then we're kind of missing the point because just like at the very beginning of Joshua, the entire beginning to the story we've been on for all these weeks is have courage. Do not fear. I am with you always. It's about the presence of God that we may know the only true God, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, our triune God. That is our true inheritance. That's the end goal, is that we may know Christ here, that we may know the Holy Spirit here, that we may follow the leading of the Spirit 
here in our everyday lives. I don't know about you, but there are times that you know, I was talking to the kids about marriage, and it's difficult some days. And um, you know, for me, I'm, I tend to be a little mouthy. I know you can't, you know, imagine that to be true, but I, I can be a little mouthy. And there are times that I hear the Spirit say, <clears throat> you know, like zip it. I mean, if God talks to me, there are times that I will run to. I mean, if I'm just like I just want to say it, I can't. I, then I go to the bathroom and I get a towel. And, I mean, I do drastic things to try to obey what I think God is telling me to do. And some of you may be, you know, more meek and mild than me. And God may want you to speak out more often. You know, it's not the same for all of us. God tells us each something different so that we move into that identity that God has called us to walk in. So being able to have the freedom to respond to the Holy Spirit instead of following the law, instead of thinking about rules about I should or I shouldn't. It's about le listening to the leadership of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Your conscience is where God speaks. And so that is the end goal, is that we may know God and that we may enjoy God and enjoy uh, living into what God has given us. Our inheritance is Jesus himself. song, hymn number 339. He bowed my vision.
accept our offerings given out of what is more precious than gold, our faith in you, giver of hope and life. And through these gifts, reveal the risen Christ in acts of mercy, love, and joy. Amen. It's time for our joys and concerns now. I didn't see anything super specific on Facebook other than uh, Carl and Tom are headed down to Arizona, and uh, I know my dad and sister are headed up north to a family reunion. I'm sure other people are traveling here today, so just prayers for everybody on the road uh, here that way, and also a, a joy. Uh, we're talking about marriage being so hard. Uh, Ken and Jeannie shot for 50 years. <laughs> so, yeah, what an accomplishment there. So congratulations there. So anybody else? Uh, we've got the microphone on the on the right here. I would ask for prayers for my brother and all the family. Um, he's in hospice tomorrow. He His life has been run by a heart machine. They're going to turn it off tomorrow at 10. So praise that the Lord takes him quickly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Proclaim the saving death of the risen Christ 
until he indeed comes to the end. O living God, for your blessing and creation, for your image deep within us, for your life in all its fullness, we give thanks. O Jesus, our brother, for your coming to earth, calling of us as your friends, for your sharing of our life and death, we give you thanks. O Spirit of grace and truth, for revealing yourself in community, healing us in our brokenness, and inspiring us with courage to share, we give you thanks. O Trinity of love, for the promise of a spreading tree giving shade and protection, for the vision of a body in which each part works for the health of the whole, for the invitation to a feast where the despised will be guests of honor, we give you thanks. And now we come together to pray with all others who call upon the name of Jesus, the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So now you may open your communion elements. <laughs> 